I bid you all, all good right. morning, good evening, and good night. I got a very special guest on from that was living in the CBD in uh, Sydney, Australia, and he's going to explain to us the 10 reasons why he left Sydney, uh, and that's Sydney, Australia, and it's been really tough for average wage earners just to scrape by and, and even pay their rents and move ahead, leaving, leaving people with little to no headway. All right, Tommy, thanks for coming on. Okay, cool. So this is 10 reasons why I'm leaving Sydney. So I'm actually not in the CBD, but I'm in the suburbs. So it's not really classified as like this Sydney metropolitan. It's more in the suburbs. So it's much cheaper. So the first, so I've lived in um, Sydney for almost 16 years. I came to live in Sydney since 2005. April, this is just a um, background about myself. So the f 10th reason is crime. So Sydney crime has been going up and up, mostly drive-by shootings and things like um, uh, drug dealing, um, assault and rape. And there's Wait, actually no-go zones. In aren't Sydney. guns banned so, in Australia? Sorry? Aren't guns banned in Australia? Um, yeah, with the 1996, um, the Prime Minister, John Howard, he banned it. So with the Port Arthur massacre, and because of that, um, he stripped away the gun um, gun rights. Interesting. Yeah. So there's still drive-by so, shootings with gun Yeah, gun there's drive-by shootings, especially in the western Sydney, so places like Bankstown. So to all the viewers living in Sydney, they would know what I'm talking about. Places like Reesby, Liverpool, um, Campbelltown, um, Fairfield, Guildford, those areas, these are like 30 to 40 kilometers away. And these areas, some sometimes at night, is no-go. So like in parks, it's a no-go zone. There's either people who are gangs or there's homeless people or there's like violent people or drunks. And like for women, it's just unsafe, completely unsafe. So after sunset, after 6, 7 p.m., women usually have to get a taxi or get a boyfriend or get like their son or brother to actually escort them because wow. some pockets of Sydney are becoming like no-go zones. So that's number one. And because of that, um, if I'm to get married and have kids, I don't want to put my wife or kids in a crime-ridden spot. Wow. Okay, number, number nine. nine censorship government corruption so the censorship is really heavy it's not as bad as victoria melbourne but um a lot of things are getting censored a lot of small parties and alternative voices such as you mike martins like anyone who's like sort of like us in sydney is usually censored and they have to really go online if they're like protesting like no one's gonna hear them or the media won't really um, well, the media will broadcast just broadcast them. The media, unless they're like about climate change, they're gonna broadcast them. If it's about other issues like homelessness or housing affordability, there's usually like zero uh, coverage. Well, nowadays, well, nowadays, if there's a protest right now, they've been doing what New Zealand and the UK and Canada have been doing. If there's a protest, let's mm -hmm. say about homelessness or housing affordability, they'll spin it as a pro-Trump protest. Yeah. And there's also um, corruption in the police force called the Wood Royal Commission. Right. And this is regarding the previous um, uh, former uh, com police commissioner of New South Wales from 1991 to 1996. His name is Tony Law. So Tony, T-O-N-Y, and Law is L-A-U-E-R. So he later resigned because... Um, it ended in controversy and because he was hiding corruption as well, he resigned. And even with um Barry O'Farrell, um the the premier, as well as um Scotty Morrison, you know, um, our great leader, our great leader in Sutherland, he he's part of them as well. Wow. And they're also part of this thing called um you know the Freemasonry, F R E E M. A S O N like the Freemasonry, like those lodges, like those secret societies. Mm -hmm. Tony Law, Barry O'Farrell, and Scotty Morrison, they're all part of it. Like okay. these secret organizations. And they're very corrupt. So I don't trust them. And also this this um like this evangelical like church, like this Protestant group called the Hillsong. And they've been engaging like child trafficking and stuff. Oh man. In places like Holesworthy. 
which is like a, near the military base. And um, because that area is forest, a lot of um, people got like um, like killed by um, the, the the child traffickers. So there were child wow. traffickers and the police. You would and, think like, Australia would even... be free of that, like wouldn't be happening. Oh, no, no, no. There's all sorts of stuff happening in Australia, not just police commission, but also superannuation commission. And you've got the royal commission as well. Right. Which is like the one into banking and superannuation and they found all sort of garbage. Yes, they, they barely scratched the surface of what they found, basically. Yeah, they they haven't it. even gone into anything. All right, let's go to number, number, we're at number, number uh, 10, 9, number 8. You, uh, number 8. So after the government corruption, you have number 8. The number 8 is, again, similar to Vancouver and Toronto. So that's negativity. So Vancouver would be like, Canada's Vancouver would be like Australia's Sydney, and Canada's Toronto would be the equivalent of Australia's Melbourne. Melbourne so you yeah. have all this negativity, this snobbishness, this arrogance, and this like hatred. Like people hate their neighbors, they hate their um, uni friends, they hate their high school friends, there's jealousy, there's greed, um, they hate their workers, they hate their neighbors, they hate everyone down the street. Like They hate people in cars. Yeah, like it was so bad. Because when I first came to Australia in 2005, it wasn't like this. Like, people were still, like, friendly and chilled. And especially what happened was, like, after 2010 and 2009, after the GFC, people started becoming a bit more negative and a bit more fake. Mm -hmm. And I could really sense it in 2012 when, like, the culture, the, 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 the culture, the atmosphere, the, the meaning of what Australia really means has be, been, like, diminished, has turned into more and more negative. And I've asked like people, like some of my new neighbors now, what was life like in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. And he says like people were much more chilled. I asked, was the people much more friendlier? And then he like looked at me with regret saying, unfortunately, yes, back in the 90s and to early 2000s and 1980s, like people were friendly. You go to bars and you go to bus stop, like people would say hi or like they were saying like, hey, I, I need some help. I don't know this bus and people will help you. But now like if you go to a bus, people will tell you to get lost and check, go check your phone. Like people want to brush you away. And every time you go on like a train, it has to be like survival of the fittest. Like you have to actually like, arrogantly push other people or else you're going to get pushed and there's not going to be any seats for you. Like people have to be fake in order to survive. It's gotten to that point. And wow. especially in places like the Eastern suburb and the Northern suburb, people are very like snobbish. Like you, you walk on a road and then you see a, a person with walking a dog or like person with a pram and then you say hi or something. And they look at you with like those Vancouver stare or the Vancouver glare. Um, yeah, I made that well video. The, the Vancouver glare is like, like yeah, yeah, it's like I'd get on an elevator in a mall or something, and people yeah. would look at me with such disgust. Yeah, they they looked at you as if you burned their house down, or as if like you've you've like killed their dog. Like when you <laughs> yeah. say like hi to their dog or like be friendly, mm -hmm. and like back in the old days, like even in the nineties, my um previous high school friends and previous neighbors and the neighbors now, they told me like when you go to like parks and stuff, like play soccer and like you accidentally kick the ball somewhere, like the other person would say like, um, here's your ball and stuff. And then sometimes you go to parks and play basketball and then you're saying like, hey dude, you wanna join in? You're like friendly. But now when you try to be friendly, you can't even get in. They're like, who's this guy? And then sometimes like you give their ball back and stuff and they look at you as if you like, are trying to steal their ball. Like just this negativity. Mm -hmm. And the same with um Seattle, like the Seattle freeze. Because when I used to work in the news agency in Sydney in 2015, we had um, my boss. He had a relative who's from who, who's um, his wife's um, uh, brother or sister's son who came to Sydney for like a holiday. And then when I when I see him, he's just like always like this blank face. Like, I don't know why. And like in Sydney, it's becoming like Seattle or Vancouver. Like people have a blank face. Like they're just a neutral face. Like they're emotionless. They're mm -hmm. soulless. Mm -hmm. Like you look at them, like they don't have a soul. Like there's no bright light in their eyes. They just look like you know, you know those NPC memes. Yeah. Like those. Gray I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Like everyone's like in Sydney are turning into NPCs, and you have the Sydney ignore and the Sydney um neglect. 
So like when you try to look at someone, like you, like it's complete strangers, and you just happen to walk, walk past them, they just ignore you. Or like if you're at the shop, you try to say hi to the cashier, they just look down at the till, like they don't even look at you. Like it's gone to that like antisocial point where people just go into self checkouts as robots, or if they go to like a service desk, the the person you want to talk to a human, but the human feels like a robot. Mm -hmm. So there's just no point. And because of this negativity, it, it causes a lot of stress and a lot of people take antidepressants. And because I work in a pharmacy, I know this, I, I, I like hand out a lot of like antidepressant drugs. And I think it's the same in Vancouver. A lot of people are depressed. Mm -hmm. um, number seven, yes. congestion slash tolls. The, the tolls in Sydney and the congestion is insane. So since 2012, the congestion has been worse. And again, it's the crumbling of the infrastructure. So you have the people exodusing out. And because of um, the middle class that's no longer there, they need to raise the tolls. So the tolls, tolls has been increased significantly as well as a congestion. So the congestion's getting worse as well because people are trying to dodge the toll roads. So they're all cramming in those highways that are toll free. Toll free, and toll free is, roads. And it's it's clogging up and a huge congestion yeah, and, and no one wants to pay yeah, to drive to go to work to a job they, they despise and sitting in a car yeah. they don't like and paying car insurance to get there and paying fuel to get there and also wearing down the brakes and, 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 and parts of their car to get there. And when they get there, they don't want to be there. And then all they think about is the weekend. Yeah, that's right. So even my friend who's driving, like he drives to work, takes about an hour. Sometimes it takes an hour and a half. Why? Because of congestion. Okay, next. And again, um, back to the tolls. The tolls, um, if you have a truck, is like really expensive. So you usually pay like 10 to 20% higher. So you have, again, like the, the Eastern distributor, it's like $16, like Australian, which is like 13 Canadian or 10 US, just one way. There's just no point. And other places like in the Western suburb, it's like 40 cents a kilometer. It's just, it's just insane. And the cap is like at $8. And if you're driving a truck, it's like, $25 Australian, which is like 15 to 18 US. Because wow. um in Sydney, the tolls are classified in class A and class B. Mm -hmm. So let's say you and your wife, your car would be a class A. So that would be like a sedan or a small car. Whereas class B is like a truck or like a minibus. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's just insane. And people are paying tolls close like 30 to 40 Australian or... 20 to 35 us a day to drive like a sedan mm -hmm. and if they're driving trucks it takes them 50 to 60 australian which is around like uh, 35 to 45 us just like in a whole day mm. and like going both ways from home to work and then work to home it's, yeah it's just just no point and because of this tolls i i just have to leave it's just it's just no point Number six, loneliness and isolation. Yeah. You know, they say, uh, Tommy, they, they, they've heard, the doctors have said that loneliness and isolation is more dangerous than obesity. That's mm. what I heard. Yeah, because the thing is, it, dam it causes something called internal inflammation. So you have something called the external inflammation. So if you burn yourself or you eat something spicy or you got, got a sickness or something, that's called inflammation. And with loneliness, it causes something called internal inflammation. So something happens to your brain. So you have all these things called hormones and you have like happy hormones when you're happy and you have sad hormones when you're like sad or depressed. And because of loneliness, a lot of people have the sad hormones mm -hmm. and that causes like inflammation in the body. And because of that, like their life expectancy is reduced. Mm -hmm. And for me, all my high school friends that are very close to me, they all left Sydney. Like, they all went to, like, Newcastle or, like, Central Coast or, like, Tamworth or Wollongong or others went to places like Brisbane or Hobart or Perth. And at the workplace as well, a lot of um, colleagues, like, every year, every year since 2005, I see people, like, not just friends but other, like, acquaintances and um, 
other people in my year group or like in my workplace like leaving for like Queensland or Tasmania because the fall of uh, the affordability is just not there and they don't really have like much friends well you can't make headway and then you, it's hard to make friends because everyone's in the same boat where they're they're yeah, just everyone's in the same boat yeah. yeah yeah it's like um the video i watched when you were still back in vancouver in like 2016 i saw some of your archive videos and i saw that um you you were walking with your dog um the florida the dog my dog florida saying, yes yeah, you were saying um, if everyone had a LCD above their heads showing how much um, money and debt they have, a lot of people in Sydney would be like negative in the negative zones mm -hmm. because of the debt. Yeah. Yeah, because, I, that, was and, um, a that was a clever video I put up talking about that. Yeah. That was actually a pretty clever idea because yeah. a lot of people wouldn't be so arrogant and uh, yeah. so tough and so fake if people knew the truth about their financial status. Yeah. Because, yeah, because that links again with the housing crisis, because Sydney's housing crisis is so expensive. Mm -hmm. um, student loans, they are pretty high. Um, car loans, they're, they're getting charged like 10 to 20 percent. And even um, there's something bad about Commonwealth Bank, not just the money laundering and all the crimes are committed. They've been overcharging farmers. So mm. farmers in rural areas are getting like overcharged. As well as um some of the small businesses like news agencies like I've worked for one before and they just hate dealing with the banks because of all these fees and all these other crap and Mickey Mouse that they charge. Mm -hmm. Even though since 2012 they've artificially lowered the rates to very very dangerous levels, the bank is still charging like 10, 20 percent rates on like very small loans, like a thousand dollar, two thousand dollar loans. Mm -hmm. It's just completely absurd, and. I don't have any relatives in um, Australia as well, so there's just no point. And I don't want to end up like the um, Tsar, which is the last emperor of Russia, mm -hmm. like a like a relative of Russia. I'll I'll show you the link later, Mike. You can just type in Russian, uh, Russian royal family, mm -hmm. Australia, and then that guy he died alone. And I I don't want to end up like him because it's just it's just it's just too depressing. Okay. And that comes in with the dating as well. Like girls, they're, they're actually, when comparing Sydney to Vancouver, they're a little bit better, but not as better. Like a woman four feet nine would not date a guy under six feet. But here, yeah, Sydney, I'm under I'm under five ten, so yeah. I'm I'm out of the loop. Like for me, I'm I, yeah. when when I lived in Miami, it wasn't a problem. I was it was no problem meeting women, but when I got yeah. to Vancouver. It was tough. Yeah. I'm under 5'10", and guess yeah. what? Nobody looks at you there. Yeah. And you also made a video on the top 10 countries where women are friendly. That is really true, Mike. Because mm -hmm. when I was working in pharmacies and news agencies, you know who's the friendliest person mm. who's actually, like, as a customer? Brazilian. It's actually people from South America. Yeah. Like, people from Brazil, from uh, Peru, mm -hmm. from Colombia, from... Mm -hmm. uh, Venezuela. Those countries are from, on that list. From like um Ecuador, even Ecuador and uh, Chile, they are like really, really friendly. Like not just not just like the mestizo, not just like the Spaniard ones, mm -hmm. but also like the indigenous, like the Incans. Like they they're just like really friendly. Like you yeah. can approach them and they well, don't why have be, like why be why be angry? Why be upset? There's no point. Yeah, and and you know what? They don't have that fakeness and that um tightness and that negativity. Like they don't look at you as if you've like burnt their house down. They don't have that. That's why I, you know, like people from those like regions. Mm -hmm. And ironically, if you're like in the middle of Sydney, let's say you and your wife and your kids came to Australia for a holiday to like the Opera House to like, hey, Mike Martin's in Australia. The f most friendliest person is not the Asians. I'm Asian myself, mm -hmm. not the Asians, not the locals, not the um, indigenous in Australia, but the Brazilian tourists. Ironically, in Sydney, the friendliest people are not the locals, but the Brazilian tourists. Mm -hmm. They are the really friendliest people. <laughs> Very ironic. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to dating, the thing is that there's like so much gold diggers like out there. Like they just want your money. Like I've seen your video where you were talking about housing crisis and the lady left the guy because he wasn't about to pay 1.2 million for like a two bed, three bed bungalow. And because of that, she left him. Like there's a lot of fake women out there. Like they're just after the money. 
And sometimes when they're like 30 years old, mm -hmm. it's harder and harder for them. Like for a man, it's okay because men, they, they still can build and they um they can still like reproduce. Whereas mm -hmm. women for their, um like when they reproduce, like have kids, like up to 35, it becomes really like hard. And there's like a higher chance of like um impairment to the baby, like um disability or things like even mortality rates for the mother when they have kids at a um higher age but unfortunately a lot of women they don't reduce their tr so they want a man with like six foot tall uh, of like six star quality like five stars max they want a six star quality like looks and they want a six figure and and they want like a ha like a really big house, like a six bed house. Like they want six everything, mm -hmm. and that's just impractical. But if the woman reduced their tier to like a guy, like an average dude, sixty to seventy grand, and then they let's say move to Brisbane or something, they're like they they'll be much happier. Like they don't think that through. That that's why a lot of like these women are like very sheeple. Like they they're not like really woken up. And I can even tell from the stream, like, I'm not trying to be sexist, but in Mike on the Night, a lot of people, like, are men, like, a lot of viewers are men, because, again, men are more, like, woke than the woman, because the women are still, like, very sheep in terms of this politics stuff. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, dating is just, there's no point, because even if you buy a woman, like, really nice things and stuff, and when she dumps you, like, as if you're, like, an empty beer can or empty soda can... There's just no point finding Sydney women because, again, those women are, like, really snobbish. Like, when you go to Bondi Beach, like, people would think, hey, Australia, the down under, like, the cool people, like, so chilled. You play soccer, you have have some sausages and have some barbecue, have a, have a soda drink, like, have a lemonade and chill. It's not, like, the women, like, they just stare at you, like, really, like, not nice. Like, and they're really condescending and sarcastic. So they always gave you that fake smile, mm. and I, I I just can't I just can't handle like that fakeness. Mm -hmm. Number five, crumbling infrastructure. infrastructure and public transport. So this coincides with the 2019 um January when I first saw your video. Um, Sydney is a s hole. Sydney mm. is a poop hole mm -hmm. where um the entire train network from east to west, north to south, southwest and northwest, all lines crashed on New Year's Eve, and like it took like eight hours just to fix the delay, and then the delay and disruptions lasted for like a week. It's that bad, mm -hmm. and um. You were right about the middle class fleeing. It's not just the private sector that's influenced, but also um, the public sector. Yeah, so, well, I was doing um, videos, get, get out of Sydney back in 2016. Yeah. So you can you can go on Google and search this. Ambulance, Sydney, longer time. And you will see that um, in Sydney, the waiting time for ambulances has basically increased. And it's it's getting worse. It's getting worse. So the healthcare system is crumbling. It's crumbling. Yeah. Do you think they're gonna pri it's, it's, they're gonna sell it off? Do you think they're gonna sell off? Because right now in the UK, they're in England, they're looking at selling off their healthcare system to a private entity. Yeah, they'll probably do the same to um Australia like very soon. They might even do it for the um. I heard the garbage men are going trains. through that. I heard the garbage men are doing it too. Oh yeah, even even the gar garbage men like they're like all tired and exhausted because um again the garbage men like the city council actually do hire like public sector workers, but the problem is the garbage men they have to go from like blue mountains like two hour drive just to pick up people's garbage and they're not gonna do that they're like why should I do this I, I might as well work in like a recycling depot and earn the same amount of money you know to private sector mm -hmm. or like in other public sector in blue mountains I'm not coming to Sydney and because of this the garbage um problem is it's it's taking longer like sometimes you can like in the morning it used to be really efficient like five o'clock six o'clock seven o'clock all the garbage is like all empty now sometimes you have to wait till like 10 o'clock or sometimes you have a seven o'clock stream like stream a they collect it once and then stream b for seven uh, for 10 o'clock so you have two morning sessions opposed to one because the amount of trash is overflowing mm -hmm. and, and it's not getting better it's like getting worse and worse all right continue 
Um, and this also reflects on the article um, in 2005, um, in like January, February, so before I even came to Australia, and it said about Sydney infrastructure being so old, like the sewers, the roads, the train networks, and it's not going to cope with an increasing population. And even if the population isn't increasing that properly or increasing that fast, because of the aging and the oldness of the network, it's 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 going to crumble either way. Even if like there's no one coming here because it's just too old, it has it's not maintained. Number four, fragmentation of quality services. So that includes private sector um, customer services as well as public sector um, service in New South Wales, which is like where you get your driver license. This coincides with your 10 reasons why you want to live Vancouver, your video. You were saying like people were not like understanding English properly and there were like language barriers. Mm -hmm. That is happening to the um, public sector jobs, a lot of them. And the public sector is going downhill, like the, the the services is going bad, and this like cuts to the public sector as well because of the shrinking private sector. Right. This they haven't got enough taxes, and so the public sector workers they have to overwork, and also the public sectors who have exodus or left Sydney, the um the public sector has to use the existing workers to do more tasks. For example, let's say before you had like ten workers in an office. You each assign them like 10 set of tasks. Now, let's say three, four of them left. There's another 40 ta tasks to be left. And that's that has to be coped. And because of that, there's an overload. And you can even see um, universities like University of Sydney, University of New South Wales. When you try to call them, the waiting time is like 10, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't like this five, 10 years, 10, 10 to 10 years ago where you only waited five minutes and someone's like, hey, and then they sort it out within 10 minutes. It's taking like 30, 40 minutes just to sort it out. And with the um, customer service, like, it's just so bad. Like, even if you get good customer service, like, those people are just, like, faking it. Mm -hmm. And when you go home and go to, like, a bus stop and then you see that person, like, who was, like, a coffee maker and they just look at you as if, like, you commit, you are, like, trying to, like, rob them or something because, or you 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 burn their house down because you just said hi to them on the bus stop. It's just, yeah. it's absurd. So and, um... I have to add on the public transport and the quality of services as well, because this was all before COVID and all before 2018, like before I first found your channel. Ever since 2016, um, this, the trains has been gone worse. So if you Google Sydney train speed, it's about 43 kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. That's how slow it is. And they charge like five Australian four to five Australian for like a 5k to 10k trip mm -hmm. um this which is like three us just for one trip it's so expensive and it's just not worth it whilst if you go to like other countries like Russia China India um Vietnam Philippines Kazakhstan in other countries like their trains they have like 150 kilometer trains like 100 kilometer trains Australia they don't have that they only have those for like tourists only for like regional um trains like those fast track ones but they're only for like um holidays right they're not for like transporting people you know or they're used for like transporting coal and stuff like commodities and resources and logistics they're not for transporting people if it's for like passengers like regular Australian properties it's like 40k it's nothing mm -hmm. and and because of that, I talked to this um, station worker at Redfern Station in um, Sydney, and he lives in Bankstown, and he said in 2016, it was getting worse. And when you go on YouTube and you type Sydney um, trains, I did an investigation and research myself. It says since 2013 to 2016, they've cut the train services by half. So let's say if you get 20 trains on this line on a day, instead of 20 like trains, you're only getting 10. And because of that, oh. it's the network is it, it can't cope. And last week, I tried to go to um Rhodes from Burwood, mm -hmm. and and the train failed. So the train left <laughs> Burwood. It's it's so bad. I have the video. I I, I I have the video. I recorded it. I'm gonna upload it to YouTube and send you the link later. Mm -hmm. and it's just so bad. So I left Burwood. So the train left Burwood at eight forty three, and then it stopped at North Strathfield. So that was only two stations. Mm -hmm. And then 
it stopped there for like 10 minutes and the um and then there was an announcement saying um sorry passengers there is a disruption we're gonna there's a problem with the previous um train before us they ha it's experiencing mechanical issues and the wait's gonna be five minutes but it ended up to be like 15 to 20 minutes mm -hmm. so eventually the train stopped at um strath uh, north strathfield at around 905 910 and then it started moving again and then uh, 915, 920, it stopped again <laughs> at Concord West. And then everyone had to get off that previous train <laughs> and go to a temporary replacement train. <laughs> and then that that and then that train it halted again. The new train halted for 20 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it finally got to road station at 920. I mean nine like 48. So it took them almost an hour just to get from North Strathfield to Rhodes. So that's like two stations, two train stations, no more than four kilometers. Mm -hmm. It took them one hour. And they were saying that mechanical defect will be fix fixed within five to 15 minutes. It took them an hour. And then the carriage there, it was like disrupting for like the next three hours mm -hmm. because we got like customers coming to our pharmacy saying like, um, uh, the train's still disrupted and still like not good, mm -hmm. and and it's just so bad. And when I got home, like when I um finished work, I heard that the entire line from Burwood, Strathfield, Epping, all the way to Hornsby, so that northern train line was like disrupted for the whole day. Mm -hmm. So they reduced the three train tracks because it's because it has three platforms for that um line, mm -hmm. like two of them has to be squished into one and the third platform which is usually for logistics and stock and like resources mm -hmm. that one has to be shared with a passenger train as well and that's that caused a disruption in the logistics so that whole thing failed for like a whole day <laughs> wow it's that bad and like even um even in 2020 and 2019 there was like a disruption as well. Like people were getting late to work like 20, 30 minutes because of our disruption in like five lines. Mm -hmm. And there was an issue where um, an old lady fainted. They should have just got an ambulance and got her right away in 10 minutes, but it took like 30, 40 minutes. And because of that, the, gov the news outlets, the nine news, like the mainstream media and the New South Wales government made an excuse saying that the Erskine view, um, there's a lady fainted at Erskine View, and because of that, that whole line is disrupted. They just use that excuse, and then that that line got disrupted for like two, three hours, causing massive delays. Oh my god! Okay, it, next it's number. It's like so bad. Okay, number three, mm -hmm. the education standard and the quality is going down the drain. Yeah, I heard that. So, like, um, what Heiser says was saying, he said, um, the education revolution it failed. Mm -hmm. as well as helping the indigenous Australians, like, closing the gap. It both failed. The government spent, like, billions, like, tens of billions poured in, and they also poured into um, the school laptops. So they were buying, like, laptops for students and um, for, like, students to learn about digital technology. But what happened was 80 90% of students were abusing it. So they were using it to play games, and nice. they got addicted to it. Yeah. And so um, they just wasted taxpayers' dollars for that. And it's just, it's, it's insane. Mm -hmm. And the uni um, fees for, let's say, like an arts degree and stuff, is like 8,000 Australian a year. And for like more expensive subjects like pharmacy or like dentist or like doctors is about 12K a year. Mm -hmm. So that's been going up, especially since the 90s, 80s, where education was free. Whilst international students, if they were to do an arts degree, they get, get they get charged like exorbitant amounts. Yes, they do. Like it, it's just it's just uncomparable. It's like if you compare international students um fees to domestic, it's like comparing Sydney real estate to Brisbane real estate or Fort Lauderdale, Florida real estate. Like yeah. that's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. Like they're getting the same education, but the fees is just yeah, it's just tremendous. Mm -hmm. Like what like in the unis, usually um, you have two semesters, right? Yeah. And usually an average course is about $10,000 for domestic, and it's loaned. So that means in one semester, it will be 5000 because you're halving the year. 
and because you have four units or four subjects, it's it costs about a thousand dollars, right? Mm-hmm. But realistically, like if you look at the materials that they're teaching you, like the textbook, you can just buy it for like two hundred dollars, and you can study that whole subject yourself. <laughs> And then you can print your own materials and stuff mm-hmm. like at a fraction of a price. You can just do that for one subject for three hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and you can do like the whole um, whole semester for like less than a thousand dollars easy. Um, so one subject sh- should cost like less than four hundred dollars with the materials, and with um, one semester it's like a thousand to two thousand dollars, and a year you double that, which shouldn't cost more than three thousand dollars. Like realistically, that's how much is realistically worth. And there was also a university scandal similar to um, yes, banks. where people apply for uh, like some courses and then they get a refund back from the college. I know. Yeah, there was a there's money a, laundering. There's a little yeah, there's something a little bit different though, mm. and it's really interesting. The thing about University of Sydney and University of New South Wales, there was a scandal about recycling exam papers and recycling notes. Mm -hmm. So the Sydney University has been using test questions that were um, tested since 2002. (laughs) So they were not updating anything new. So in university, you're supposed to like, they call it like a vibrant university where you learn new skills and cutting edge at the forefront and very tech savvy and like, you should, you are going to have a passionate career, this, that, but they've been recycling the course material for like the past 20 years. <laughs> like <they've, laughs> they even have like things from 19. So yeah, cutting edge and we're recycling. They're doing a good job advertising it at <laughs> least. <laughs> and they're charging international students with that. Like <laughs> it's, it's absurd. It's disgusting. Okay. Continue. Um, yeah. If you look at, um, how much, um, international students are paying, Let's say a Bachelor of Economics or Bachelor of um, Business or Commerce in Uni of Sydney, it's like 46,000, 46,000 Australian a year upfront. Mm-hmm. Imagine studying that for 46, like 46 grand large, which is about, you, you convert the rate to US, which mm-hmm. is, let's say 75 cents um, US is one Aussie dollar. You're paying literally 35 grand American as an international student just to study recycled papers. That's realistically <laughs> worth $400 a course. So $400 a course, you times by eight because you have eight courses a year. That's worth 3,000, like 2,000 to 3,000 Americans. So you're t- paying 10 times the price <laughs> just mm-hmm. to get um, a a useless degree for one year. This is just one year. If you're paying, if you're doing three year degree, it's gonna cost you 110, 105 grand large in US. And that's, which is, if you account into the course material, the mm-hmm. textbook, as well as the wages for the professors yeah. and the contact hours that you're getting, it's realistically worth 10 grand for like three years it, it's realistically worth three grand per year 10 grand for three years yeah that's, that's what, what realistically, realistically should be worth. that's before uh, student loans and uh, became federalized once they started federalizing yeah. student loans the price of tuition went up the price of books went up and the price of everything went up and yeah it's disgusting yeah next yeah and they're recycling this stuff like even in like um these colleges like those private tuning colleges they're literally like getting a two hundred dollar textbook. They're photocopying ten pages out of it and charging like six hundred dollars a semester. So that's like six hundred for like ten weeks. Like in high school, this is high school. But if it's in uni tuition, mm-hmm. it'll cost you like three thousand dollars just for like one course. Let's say one course three thousand dollars in tuition fees Mm -hmm. you can just buy a two hundred dollar textbook and then get some youtube videos for free and then buy some paper (laughs) and then get a get like a one-on-one tutor for like five hours that will cost you together less than a thousand dollars but you're you're paying like three thousand dollars just for that it's it's insane Mm -hmm. and 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 the education especially the private um tutoring system they're mm-hmm. looking at international students and domestic students as cash cows. So the domestic students, they're just going to loan them. And the international students, they're just going to take their money um, 
outright as cash cows. And because of this, a lot of international students are exodusing and um, temporary visas and exchange students, they're no longer picking Australia because Sydney, the nightlife is dying and the mm. education standard is dying and they're getting ripped off in all these random, bizarre, weird, Mickey Mousing deals. I like Mickey and you Mouse even, deals. You can, and this is all bef- this is all pre-COVID. It's not because of COVID-driven that international students are going broke. There were international students in my old home in um, Kingsford, which is in um, Eastern Sydney near UNSW. There were like six people squished in like a two-bed apartment. Like um, they had like two people s- sleeping in a double du- bunk bed. Well, it doesn't Zealand. beat the one in New Zealand. And, and I think it was, I don't know, I don't I remember what city in New Zealand, but there was 42 people to a house. Yeah. And there was like one other person sleeping in like another bed, so three people in one bedroom. And then they divide the dining room and the living room into two rooms. Yeah, they put rooms. bunk beds in the dining room. And it's just horrendous. And there's like people, like temporary visas, who are doing like Uber Eats, who are getting exploited. And they have two people in garages. It's it's just phenomenal. Like there's like five people sharing one toilet, and like. In 2012, I, I saw, like, my next-door neighbor, and there was just so much noise, and the neighbor below me had to lodge a complaint. And then I think the landlord got fined or, like, had a warning saying, like, if you if you have, like, this sort of um, illegal housing, you're going to get fined or, like, some some sort of, like, caution, like a warning, because mm-hmm. it was just so bad. Like, they, they got up to eight people in a room, like, like eight people in, like, a two-bed unit, so four people in a room, like... It's just horrendous. Mm-hmm. And like, I saw this, um, I just happened to um, take out the trash and I opened the door mm-hmm. and then I saw one from the international students opening their door and I saw like, it's messy. There's like um, Coke cans everywhere. Like oh, video parties! Game, like video game, throw, like video game cassettes thrown on the floor, like um, cockroaches, um, like... Dorito chips everywhere, like leftover yeah. burgers, moldy sandwiches. It's just like unclean. Mm-hmm. And they even had a water leak. And the um, neighbors downstairs had to lodge a complaint. And when the um, plumber came in and saw like the amount of people living in the place, and that's when they complained about it. And mm-hmm. that's how um, that landlord got punished. And because of that, he had to lower the rent because he was like spiking up the rent. Like each of these students are paying like a hundred bucks. And you have seven people squished. They're paying seven hundred. I was paying like four seventy a week for like same area for like a family of three, me, my mom, my dad. Whilst they were like seven people paying seven hundred for like the same like room, like same rooms, like two bed, one bath. Like it's just horrendous. Mm-hmm. Like to to see what what's happening. Okay. And um, with the education standard. They also had a scandal where um, they were giving um, education to anyone that could walk. Yes. Like you were have, making the video about the Sydney powder keg where mm-hmm. the banks are giving out loans to anyone that could walk. Yeah. <laughs> because, like, they, they, the, 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 um, the people who were taking those home loans, they couldn't even pay it off, especially after the interest-only um, mortgages came into fruition in 2018, 2019. Mm-hmm. They were paying interest and principal. They couldn't pay it back. Like, they were struggling. <laughs> and in Australia, I you know people who are like top notch, like really smart, they were getting like 99 ATAR or 99 out of 100 Mm -hmm. in like um, an arts degree or like they were like doing really good in English and literature, but then they decided to go to a science degree and they were like failing four subjects or failing three subjects. So if you fail four subjects, you fail the whole semester Mm -hmm. because they were doing like science. And because the science, it's based on the high school they don't have that knowledge, you see. Sure, mm-hmm. they have 99 marks, but they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the chemistry. They don't have the physics to accompany it, and they were struggling. And because of that, the government launched an investigation into um, University of Sydney and University of New South Wales. They found out they were ripping off um, international students. They were found out to um, giving out all these student loans, like, like as if they were printing like money, like money printer go bird, as if they were like, printing out like quantitative easing like there's no tomorrow they were just giving out loans to anyone that could walk right. and because of this the sydney of the sydney university and uni of new south wales had to um label everything in their um fine print or the mm-hmm. uni of study saying that you need 
HSC, um, let's say, which is high school certificate, year 12 Australia, like equivalent, because you need to do the HSC to get into uni. Mm -hmm. So you have to have like maths two units or like a chemistry in order to do this subject. Before it used to be um, optional, but now they're making it mandatory because so many students were failing. Like in one subject, there were like 50, 60% of people failing that subject because they didn't even have the assumed knowledge and the uni was just giving out courses to anyone. And they were also um, giving this thing called the ATAR bonus, sort mm -hmm. of like the um, home grant. So like the government pays you 50,000 for you to buy a house or something like that. So if you have 85 ATAR and you couldn't get into a course that's 90, they give you five ATAR as a bonus just for you to get into that course. And because you can get into that course, the uni is able to get money from the government as a grant and they use that money to give to the students and mm. the students um, pay that loan off to the uni and then the uni pay it back to the government. That's how it works. Mm. And, okay, and the fair enough. And the uni were like borrowing so much from the um, government and the government coffers are like getting, getting eaten up and the government is going into deficit. And because of that, the government's like, I, I, we need to conserve our money. And then they made it really hard line on the university. So the university decided to be like more stringent, more hard lined compared to 2016, 2015, 2014, mm -hmm. where they were just giving courses out to anyone. And they were like, they were recycling like the course material, like they even recycled um, exam papers. And because of this, and because of um, technology... I like how you recycled exam papers. I like how you bring yeah. that up. That's really nice. Yeah. We have, like, Facebook and Twitter and all these um, student websites, such as um, Scribed. Mm -hmm. You heard of Scribed? Yeah. Scribed and, like, um, student online notes. So you can just type... You can just go to this website called Student. Docu, which is S T U D O C U, and and studentvip.com.au, and mm -hmm. people they buy and sell like uni notes, and there's like exam papers getting uploaded. Like people are selling exam papers like for twenty bucks, thirty bucks, and the university is cracking down on them hard. Mm -hmm. And because of this, some someone um is able to obtain the 2013, 2012 paper, and then they were like doing it they were studying it they even have the answer sheets and they were studying it really hard and then because of that the examiners in sydney uni and unsw they were really lazy they were recycling on test paper questions and then they had an official 2016 exam because that student mm -hmm. was able to study the year before like the 2015 exam paper really really well he went into the 2016 exam and then he like aced the test because it was recycled all right, continue. Like, Next on the list. Every single question was recycled. Like, like if you had 100 questions, 100 marks, like 90 questions were like recycled. Even the multiple choices, like they were recycled, like word by word. Okay. Next on the list. We're approaching an hour, so let's get this. Let's let's wrap it up. Yep. Yeah. And then um the last one um the um number two um is pollution. Mm -hmm. Air quality, water quality, land quality is going bad. So mm -hmm. you heard about um, what happened in Mascot, of the um, towers and Erskineville, of the sugar cube, right? Of mm -hmm. the toxic waste dump and the polluted um, groundwater. So that's in the east of Sydney because it used to be an industrialized um, area. So the groundwater is polluted as well as the rivers. So the Cook River, back in the 1930s in a suburb called Marrickville, you were able to swim and fish in the river. But now it's so polluted... <laughs> And people joke saying like, if you jump in, you're gonna melt. You're gonna mm -hmm. like be burnt by acid. Like it, wow. it stinks. Like there's mosquitoes and stuff. They were the government has recently cleaned it up a little, so it's gone better. But there is also another river called the Parramatta River, which flows into the Sydney Harbour. And with the fishing community, there's a harbour bridge rule. So anything east of the Harbour Bridge, so like Opera House mm -hmm. and Manly and Double Bay, like that's where like the former Prime Minister lived, Malcolm Turnbull, like those rich posh suburbs, mm -hmm. you can fish and eat the fish. But if you go anything west of the harbour, you can't eat any fish because there were um, 
toxic because of dioxins and that causes like cancers um all sorts of diseases nervous problems skin problems and because of that in sydney you can't fish and also in botany bay near the airport it's really polluted as well and there's like oil leaks so i remember in 2007 2008 i went to the foreshore which is near the botany bay on um, beach mm. and i was just um playing with sand because i was a kid back then and then i saw like this um rusty smell and this like brown chocolatey caramel orange color i said this is not normal my hand was getting oily and my dad was like no don't touch that because my dad was like a metals engineer like a material science engineer so he he he, he knew like it's polluted and after that in t- 2012 2013 um bondi beach um kuji beach or the eastern suburbs there was like algal blooms because of sewage overflow there was so much sewage overflow that mm-hmm. the beaches were getting um polluted and fish is like dying and in botany bay the water it became like red like blood and sometimes it's because of algae other time it's because of um something called um ferrous mm-hmm. pollution so there's too much iron in the water and with iron from from chemistry class it usually acidifies the water to like a ph of 6.5 or something so you can't swim in that sort of water you will get like acid burns on your skin and like sulfur like i'm just the way you pronounce the way you're uh uh, addressing it is just it's just funny the way you're talking the way you're so excited about you know not excited but you're so like really want to get this message across but it's kind of I'm not laughing. I'm laughing because the, yes. it's just it's just the surprise yeah. you have in you. Like you're so disappointed, yeah. but you're like, damn it, you know? Yeah, it's it's that sense of regret. Yeah, you know, it's like it's like you saying like it's like it's like you saying you wish you left Vancouver early, right? Mm-hmm. Or like you left Toronto early. Like I wish I left like Sydney early as well. Mm-hmm. I, I was expecting like Sydney when I first came to Australia. I thought Sydney was like this magical place, like w- what you said. Like, but it's not. It's like not good at all. And the air pollution is not good because in China and India and places like that, you have this sooty air, so like there's dust. But in Sydney, there's a lot of toxic gases that are colorless, so you can't see them because they're colorless gases, mm-hmm. and that causes a lot of problems. Um. The reason about the Sydney um, harbour pollution, it's because of a place called Rhodes, where I, like, work. Mm -hmm. They used to make something called Union Carbide. Like, they used to make batteries and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, like battery acid. Yeah. Yeah, lead and stuff like that. And um, they were Mickey Mousing, and they even made um, Agent Orange. Like, the stuff stuff they used in Vietnam War in the 70s in, Mm -hmm. um, in Rhodes. But that was, like, all, like... They started in the 60s, obviously, but, like, this was, like, all confidential government um, documents until they later released it. And then now you got people living in that area, like, getting cancers and stuff, like, all of a sudden. And they were, like, tracing, like, trying to do genetic tests or these CD scans. They were, like, saying, my family never got cancer, but I suddenly got this disease. And then the doctors was, like, we exposed, and they were, like, yeah, I used to work in this factory and stuff like that. And, you know, the Opal Towers... Yes. That was originally open in um August, and then later um something happened in Christmas Eve, and everyone got evacuated. Everyone had that to get evacuated. That was built yes. on top of a swamp. That was built on top of a yes, swamp. Yes, it was b- built on an old garbage dump, right? Yeah, and you know, back in I didn't. Didn't they build myself. the Olympic Village there too? Yeah, they built an Olympic. Yeah, and that's what I want to get into because I just um learned something new today as well early in the morning when I was reading about Rhodes. Mm-hmm. They were about to build like a riverside Olympic Park in Rhodes, like mm-hmm. in the place I work, but they abandoned it in the eighties and nineties because of the lead and the toxins, and because of that they abandoned the Rhodes project and mm-hmm. built the Olympic Park in um in um homebush bay in um homebush as opposed to roads because of the carbide batteries because if you have a um olympic park near the river near the sea it just looks nice Mm -hmm. but they have to build it in a swamp because the area near the river is all polluted and that's why they build it in the um olympic park Mm -hmm. and back in the 1800s 
that used to be like an abattoir so they w- used to kill animals and they used to dump like um organic waste or like um leftover um food or like vegetable waste and like weeds and stuff like garden weeds leftover mm-hmm. excess they used to dump it in home bush but later on they started dumping like chemicals especially with um this company called orica o-r-i-c-a orica those were the same guys who polluted um mascot like the mascot mascot like, towers yeah ground water yeah they're the same perpetrators who've polluted um the mascot um un- ground water in year nine I had a um, school excursion to um, Orica. We were like studying a topic called pollution in year nine geography class. And like, like the, there was this Orica guys like um, showing us around like Orica employees as well. And there was a government employee or something like that. And then um, they were teaching us. And then like um, my teacher was like really skeptical and because I was like 15 years old at, at that time, I was like not very street wise. I said like to like one of the employees, are you hiding something? Are you doing a conspiracy? Is this just a tip of the iceberg? This was back in 2011. I was like, are there any more pollution? And then the, um, the employee was caught out. Like, you know how you catch people like in a lie, Mm -hmm. like his eyes were like shifting left and right, like sideways (laughs) because I said, like, are you hiding any more, um, any more pollutions? And he was like hiding his eyes (laughs) and then everyone in the class laughed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, number one and, um, yeah, I'll finish the pollution really quickly and also land pollution in Sydney is getting worse, not just water and air, but land. So there's a lot of lead in the major highways, especially near Haberfield. Again, it's the inner west, and the soils are testing like 180 or 150, like PPMs or something, like Holy five times, crap. four times above like above like normal standard levels. Mm-hmm. And like because of that, a lot of families are exodusing the inner west, not just because of like, million for a three-bed bungalow not because of that but also because of pollution like you can't you can't grow anything in your backyard back in the 50s 60s you can grow something and like the land is good quality but like because now the pollution like you can't grow like anything because it's just not safe and even in mascot like you you can't really grow anything because the the groundwater is polluted it's like lead and mercury and all sorts of stuff Mm-hmm. And um, there was another issue with Waterloo, a suburb in Sydney, and um, Zetland. That area used to be swamps as well. It was called Waterloo Dam. When the English first colonized Sydney, they built something called Waterloo Dam near that area, and that used to be like a swampy area. And then they later covered it. And now they built like high rises all over that area, like Zetland, um, Waterloo in like the inner city area that used to be like a lake and a dam and a swamp and ponds. Mm. And they built like massive high rises, like, like right now, like during COVID and even like 2018, 2019. Well, no, during COVID, uh, construction was mandatory. That was essential business because Australia, New Zealand, UK and Canada and parts of America, the economy is built off of housing housing yeah essentially yeah and opal towers is the same thing like they were built on like a swamp a dump and same with roads like after the union carbide battery they covered that polluted land with grass and that grass <laughs> looked, like very yellow and so it, it looks like um like those cartoons like in the simpsons where you have like those radioactive waste that kind of color like in homer simpson's workplace mm-hmm. like those radioactive color and I also stumbled onto a blog, like, written by someone regarding the Rose Carbide. And I saw in the comment section of this guy, he said he was, a, like, a boomer born in the 50s. And he said in the 60s, 70s, when, um, during the Vietnam War, he, he found, like, barrels of, like, these wastes with, like, those radioactive color in the nice. mangroves. So, like, in the, in the swamps of, like, Homebush Bay. And, like, um, people were getting cancers. And, like, like because of that, some doctors were saying, like, did you get, like, radiation or something? Like, like some people say, like, even conspiracies say, like, in that swamp, Homebush Bay, Olympic Park, and Rose, there's actual, like, radioactivity. 
and not just because of like the toxic carbide batteries and those non radioactive pollutants but some people say this like radioactive waste buried in mm -hmm. um roads as well as radioactive waste buried in um lucas heights which is um ANSTO, which is ANSTO, uh, Nuclear Research Facility in Australia. Because mm -hmm. Australia had two nuclear tests in South Australia back in the 1950s. And I watched a um, documentary, it's still on YouTube. They mm -hmm. um, declassified a lot of files in the 1970s, 80s. And they were actually um, using the soldiers as guinea pigs and the Aboriginal people and the farmers as guinea pigs just to test what the radiation would do to like these people yeah and that's happened across america and other parts too yeah. where they they do this this yeah. testing on on innocent yeah. families and people yeah. yeah and in 2010 like after the fukushima they they um offered like um pensions and stuff but they were only giving like 600 dollars a week like to these victims that's like that's like nothing <laughs> like mm. like Six hundred dollars. Let's say you got, get a cheap rent for three hundred dollars, and your grocery is like two fifty. You have nothing left. They were mm. giving like this much, and like a lot of survivors died, so they couldn't um do a testimony, and like they were so shocked that the government was hiding this, and they finally realized like when they published a scientific report by universities, like after they were studying the effects of like all these areas, they say like the whole of Australia is polluted with radiation, so nowhere is safe. Mm -hmm. And even with the Fukushima, like, have you seen the picture of um all these yellow color like polluting the whole Pacific Ocean? Like, yes, that I've seen that. Map? Yeah, I have that seen that. Yes, true. the same happened to Australia, but the government is covering it up. Like they're covering Fukushima just like they're covering the 1950, 1960 South Australian nuclear test because mm -hmm. it was during the Cold War. Like Britain, France, America was trying to compete with the Soviet Union, like with the arms race. Like, they were, like, hiding so much stuff. And again, on the Soviet side, they committed a lot of bad things as well. They did a lot of um, nuclear tests on, like, Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, a lot of, like, villages and stuff got cancer. And they have this radioactive lake in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And the villages and stuff, like, they have, like, birth defects. And a lot of, like, lambs and sheep, like, the animals were, like, three legs or four legs. And the government, like, didn't say anything until, like... 2010s like even after collapse of soviet union like the government like the new government of kazakhstan they still like hide same with australia same with the um us as well they're still like hiding it because they're just afraid of the backlash like they know how bad it is just like chernobyl as well like that's how bad it is mm -hmm. okay and i'm gonna get to number one number one is cost of living that's what's um again reflecting the snobbishness reflecting all the loss of my friends like exodusing the price of food let's say in 2005 when i first immigrated to australia the price of food like you can just get a hundred bucks a week and you can buy all your groceries for like a family of three or four and you have a little bit left for going out and the rent back then was like under 250 for mm -hmm. like a two bed even in cities you're not paying more than 350 400 but if you're paying 350 400 in the city for a two bed back in 2005 you're getting like a luxury condo like a two bed three bed like a luxury like a good quality mm -hmm. but now like 400 500 you're just getting like a two bed like cockroach infested tear down like <laughs> unlivable mm -hmm. it's just insane and the food price for a family of four is like 250 to 300 Australian, which is like 180 US. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how bad it is. And the home price back in um when I first um immigrated here to Australia, like a two bed, one bath, like unit, just a standard unit would mm -hmm. be 180 grand Australian. It was like really cheap back then. Yeah, which is worth about 120 grand US back then but back then the wages were like for for average wages was like 800 to a thousand but right now the average is like a thousand two hundred to a thousand six hundred sure the wages has like increased by 50 percent that means the um the 180 grand um unit should be 
50% more expensive should be like 270 if it's, grand. If it's within not. wages. But it's like 450 grand, but it's tripled. So the wages increased by 50%, but the price of housing is increased 300%. So oh, more than that. 300% is being generous. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of, um, believe it or not, Mike, you were doing an exodus on Canada. You were saying like Europeans are leaving um, Canada. There's <laughs> also a lot of European descendants leaving Australia. You oh. may see like a lot of Australians going to Greece or going to Croatia or going <laughs> to Spain like for like holiday. But, but the truth of the matter is they're actually house hunting. They actually want to buy something because I've seen your video on like a thousand dollar homes in Italy. A lot of Australians are doing the same. Like, like if you go on Google and type in "renounce Australian citizenship," I, I saw that. And actually, you type it's a in, big thing. Um, renounce Australian citizenship phone number, and you have the Home Affairs, um, the Immigration Authority. Mm -hmm. You give them a call and ask them how many people are renouncing Australian citizenship a year. I gave a call to them, and they said seventy thousand to eighty thousand people a year renounce Australian citizenship. And I said, why? And they say, because of the taxes, um, the cost of living. And they say they're predominantly, like, again, European. There, there are Asians as well, like my Filipino friend who immigrated Australia in 2001, and then he left in 2018, mm -hmm. as well as my um, material science um, Indonesian neighbor who did material science in New South, Uni of New South Wales, but he couldn't find job because there's no private sector industry manufacturing left. So mm -hmm. he left in 2020. Like, there's heaps of people, like, leaving. And the cost of renouncing Australian citizenship is about $205. And the majority of them leaving are, like, dual U.S. Um, Australian citizens or dual Canadian Australian or, like, dual European Australian. So, like, people holding Greek and Australian passports or, like, Portuguese Australian passports or, like, Italian Australian passports or Hungarian Australian passports. Like, those people who immigrated Australia in 1940s, 50s, like Hungary, um, Spain, um, Greece, Italy, like, they build the dams mm -hmm. and they build the infrastructure. the infrastructure, they build the roads, like, what happened in Canada. A lot of them who's got, like, great-grandparents or grandparents um, are descendants. Descendants, they've... they're, they're, those countries like Scotland, Portugal, Spain, yeah. they're actually allowing people that had great-grandparents that lived uh, yeah. to use them, yeah. to use their lineage to allow you to gain citizenship to go back. Yeah, and a lot of, um, a lot of um, Australians are, like, renouncing citizenship and leaving, and, like, the people that came in the 90s and 2000s, like, people my age, like, Generation Z and even millennials, people a little bit older than me, they, they, they are leaving. Like, even though they were, like, some of them from China, some of them from Korea, some of them from Indonesia, from Thailand, from Vietnam, from Philippines, they're all going back to their home country. Like, even though it's third world, they don't want to pay too much for housing. And especially with that um, American friend of mine, he said he's retiring in the U.S. no matter what. Because... Again, because of the cost of living, the food, everything, the home price, everything. Like, even for me, like, if I couldn't, if I um finished my studies and stuff, I would go back as well. Because the thing about Europe and Asia and, like, South America, they have, like, different immigration laws. You have to, again, like, look at the fine print. Like you were telling your viewers, you have to look at the fine print. For, like, a lot of Asian countries, if you, you're, like... Um, born in Asia, like 80s, 70s, and you want to go back, sometimes you have to, like, make sure you have, a, like, a uni degree or some sort of, like, legitimate reason, like a descendant, to actually go back. So a lot of people, like, even in Australia, are trying to go back. Like, a lot of um business owners that came in the 70s, like Vietnamese and Chinese and, like, Malaysian, and then they want to retire, and they're, like, 2010, 2015, a lot of them like shut down re their restaurants or their news agencies and they're just going back. They're like, I'm fed up with this. Even with my um, uh, my news agency boss, he's Indonesian, like Indonesian Chinese. And he said he wants to retire like in Bali because mm -hmm. he said he's just like chilled. He doesn't want to like live in that constant cycle. And yeah. if you go to like Bali or like Thailand, you'll see like heaps like 
like Australians, not like thousands, but like tens of thousands, like hundreds of thousands, like in scattered in Asia, like different countries, mm -hmm. like people who work there or people who are IT, but they can work, like they can take their jobs anywhere or they're freelancers, like journalists and stuff. They all like live in these areas because again, the food is cheaper. Everything's cheaper. Well, definitely, people are going to Thailand. People are going to places like uh, uh, another popular is it's not via, uh, Laos and oh, yeah, um, Laos, yeah, Laos. Laos, and Burma, there's one more. There's one more, there's one more. Well. Cambodia. Yeah, Cambodia and Burma. People going there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Good. and even you were saying like you're going to the Philippines like later. We built a house on. in this the Philippines. Like, now with the stupid COVID, we can't even go see it. Yeah, <laughs> like. Like a lot of like this is like not any new idea. Like a lot of people has been doing this, because my dad, um, he used to be like working like in Australia in like a um, for a light bulb company, and later he did like material science to study and work in the uni. But then there were no jobs like private sector like manufacturing, so he did interpreting because he 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 speaks Chinese like mm -hmm. fluently. So he did a lot of like interpreting and he was asking me like um, if he wanted to like go to China and retire because in China you can pick up like a condo like luxury like in a tier two city for like about 400 grand Chinese. But if you're picking up something built in the 90s, you can get something for like 200 grand Chinese. Mm -hmm. But even if like a two bed, three bed is costing you 200 to 300 grand um, Chinese money, the average wage earners in that local area it's still about five six thousand chinese money so you're making about 1500 chinese and you're like a week and you're buying a home that's 200 to 300 thousand chinese for two three beds or you're gonna stay in australia and earn about 1500 australian dollars like the same number but you're paying like a two bed one bath for like 500 grand australian we're looking at bang, no for, the bang for the buck bang for there's the no buck. bang for the buck yeah there's no bang for... and australia has the highest like income tax like even for minimum wage you have to pay 15 to 20 percent mm. for china u.s canada i'm not sure about canada but like for like other asian countries the income tax is like 10 percent or five percent mm -hmm. like if you're an apprentice or like if you're like electrical or doing like sewing buttons or doing something simple like minimum wage you're not getting taxed more than 5%, like in a lot of like Asian countries like Vietnam and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, Thanks um, for the buck, yeah. my friend. Yeah. Do you know that there's like a lot of tax-free states in the U.S.? Yes, there is. I know. I like yeah. Income tax, yeah. I remember my um my um high school friend, like American friend from Pennsylvania, he said like later he wants to go back to America because like he can get something in Pennsylvania for 150 grand for four beds, three beds. Yeah, with a pool. Rather than something in Australia for three beds, 1.8 million. And he says like if he goes to North Dakota, I mean South Dakota, mm -hmm. South Dakota is actually tax free and they sell teardowns for 60 grand. But yeah, if you're you could buy grand, stuff super get... cheap across America. Unfortunately, yeah. America's turning into a Marifornia because a lot of people are leaving the expensive cities yeah. that have been bought out, yeah. just like Sydney. New York is yeah. there. So is uh, Illinois. And Illinois. so is uh, Oregon, Washington State, and California are becoming like that. So those people are migrating into the middle, of Amer middle part of America, mm. and they're driving up the prices in Texas, Arizona, uh, Colorado, uh, Alabama. North and South Dakota, Georgia, and Florida. Mm. Yep. And don't forget Wyoming. Wyoming is booming. Wyoming. Mm hmm And and that state is tax-free, so a lot of young families are going there. And the same pattern is coming to um, Australia. So, like, Sydney, Melbourne would be, like, California, Vancouver, Toronto equivalent. Mm -hmm. And Queensland, Western Australia, uh, Hobart, Tasmania, and South Australia would be, like, would be like Manitoba or like Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Queensland would be like Florida, Texas, um, all these like warm states. Mm -hmm. And Tasmania, South Australia, like and other parts of Victoria, not Melbourne, like not the greater Melbourne region, would be like um, North Dakota, South Dakota. Because in Australia, like with the Southern Hemisphere, 
when you get closer to Antarctica, it becomes colder and the yes. north is more hotter. Whereas, like, if you're in the US or Canada, you're like the more north you are, you're closer to the North Pole. So, the more south, like, the warmer it is. So, a lot of people are exodusing to Queensland. And from the last quarter, since um, October, the prices jumped up like 20% boom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, because people, that, I guess, are moving to more affordable yeah. areas. They're going to drive the prices with, um, up in those areas. Adelaide um, teardowns used to be like 200 grand for like a teardown, like a three bed teardown. Now it's like 400 grand, like in some areas, or like mm-hmm. three, 300 or 280. Like it's 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 getting it's starting to become like pinching, like becoming like unaffordable. Mm-hmm. But again, some areas like if you go really north Queensland and really inland, but it's like really hot. Like some of those areas are still affordable, mm-hmm. but you, you're seeing you're seeing like a five percent, ten percent jump as well in those areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Is that it? Uh, that's it. And ten- I'll just read out the ten reasons. So first one, the number ten is crime. Number nine is censorship and government corruption. Mm-hmm. Number eight is the negativity snobbishness that you see on trains when you sit next to someone on a train. Like, they look at you as if, like, you stole their seat. Um, number seven, congestion. It just takes 30, 40 minutes extra just to get to work. Loneliness, isolation. Everyone's very cliquey. You have to have, like, high school friends in order to have, like, real friends. And, like, you can't – you literally can't make friends at work or uni. It's just really hard. Mm-hmm to even talk to people like even talk to people in parks and bars and bus stops like asking for road that's how bad it is Mm -hmm. um number five the crumbling infrastructure the trains are failing the buses is failing um the ambulances the waiting time is longer the hospital waits the doctors the waits too long the fragmentation of these services again ambulance and doctors and um government services driving license you you can't even get it done within 30 minutes like a 30 minute task it's going to take you two hours. Mm-hmm. Um, education standards is going down. Um, recycling questions. Um, they're just turning education as a private sector. Like, yeah. turning education into... And they like raise a, rates as they feel... Uh, raise uh, yeah. rates, yeah. Because of inf- international students, they just use any, like, mafia methods, like the strata, just to just cut you up, just to take your cash it's just highway robbery Mm -hmm. and number two is the pollution in the air um lead pollution in the land um in roads in home bush like dumps that like condos built on top of dumps like 20 30 stories like built on top of dumps Mm -hmm. um the water pollution as well like you can't fish um and number one the cost of living the food it's getting getting out of hand like if you have a family of three or four, it's going to cost you more than 300 400 just to get basic, basic groceries. Wow. And back in 2005, if you have $100 down, you can get basic grocery for your family and you can, like, buy, like, takeouts, like, two, three days, like, a week. Mm-hmm. Like, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. Like, 100 bucks will get everything covered. But that, but those days, the golden years, the good times are gone. And mm-hmm. the home prices, again, it's just, it's just phenomenal. Mm-hmm. it's just not worth it and if you're getting like if you want a like a minimum wage worker they should be able to afford like one bed or a studio but within the greater sydney region if you drive a hundred kilometers you won't see a one bed listing for under 250 grand australian so it's just no bang for the buck mm-hmm. all right tommy i and appreciate uh... that's it yeah, we've been talking for an hour and seven yeah. almost an hour and 20 minutes i appreciate yeah. the in-depth i'm gonna name this video now the in-depth uh, 10 reasons why I left Sydney, Australia. Then this way it's going to explain to yeah. people that this is a more in-depth mm-hmm. video. Video, yeah. And again, I want to put this to the viewers, especially to people in Sydney who are listening right now, who are hesitant or who haven't made up their minds where to leave or not, or where to retire. The Golden Roys don't retire to, in Sydney. And go to Mike Martin's video and type in Sydney. And if you see the 1955 video... That sort of golden years when neighbors knew each other, Sydney was like really good. That's completely gone until 2010. So 1945, end of the war up to 2010, those were the golden years. After 2010, it was bad. And after 2015, 16, it became a dystopia. And if you're planning to come to Sydney, just don't come. There's no point. No bang for the buck. (laughs) And again... I'm making this video because I was inspired by um, Mike of leaving Vancouver and Anthony. 
who left from California to Texas, as well as the 10 reasons why I want to leave, leave Sydney mm-hmm. by the previous guy in 2018, October, by mm-hmm. Anonymous. So um, Yeah, Anonymous yeah, made that video it. with me. Yeah. Yeah, do you remember that one? The yeah, that was a long October? time ago. Yeah. Yeah, I want to reflect on that. I want to add some depth because I, I don't want anyone to buy those apartments and get trapped. I, I've personally seen um these people like i've met those people in mascot like those owners who came to our shop to buy something i've seen those frustrations like firsthand i I was like emotional as well i feel like genuinely sorry for them i'm not trying to be superhero but i just want to like genuinely warn people like not to be trapped because in australia if you get into like property or something and you're trapped and you're foreclosed you you declare bankrupt you have to like you're just getting like a bad record not like in the U.S. where you hand over the keys and you're free. It's different. Yeah, it follows you pretty much for the rest of your life. I know. Well, for your life. You're, you're getting trapped for life. But in the U.S., you return the keys, you're, you're cool. But in Australia, once you're trapped, you're trapped for life. So just be careful. All right. All, All right, right, Tommy, thanks, thanks for Mike. coming on and giving us the update. Thank you, Mike. All right.